This is going to be verse by verse for Galatians chapter 4. Now let's look at verse 1. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all. So when the heir is still a child, he's no greater than a servant. Just like when you were under the law before salvation, you were a servant to sin. You were in bondage to the law. It was your schoolmaster. And this chapter has to do with your transition from a servant to a son. For example, Jesus Christ took on him the form of a servant, even though he was Lord of all. In Galatians 3, 24 and 25, it says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. So the law was your schoolmaster. And you couldn't whip it because it whipped you. And back when I was in high school in the late 2000s, the teachers had those long paddles with the holes drilled in them. And if you got out of line, they would swing those things and hit you as hard as they could. The law is like that. It smites you and makes it where you can't even sit down. But once you reach the age of accountability, you realize you're a guilty sinner, the law, it smites you. It's a schoolmaster. And that is why Paul says in Galatians 4, 2, as a child, you're under tutors and governors. He says, but, uh, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. The tutors and the governors are the rules and regulations of the law. The time appointed of the Father is when Jesus Christ came down in likeness of sinful flesh to die on the cross. And this would be what verse 4 refers to when it says, But when the fullness of the time was come. So when the heir is a child, there isn't any difference between him and a servant. And then when he gets the inheritance, he's no longer under the tutors and governors. And it wouldn't make sense for him to go back under the tutors and governors. Just like it wouldn't make sense for us to go back under the law. Maybe you were saved out of the Catholic Church and you realized those works couldn't save you and you believed the gospel. It wouldn't make sense for you to go back under that work system after you receive salvation by faith. Paul says in verse 3, Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. As a child, you were in bondage. You were under the schoolmaster. You were under the tutors and governors. But when God sent his son, this changed. And for this reason, we can be saved and made heirs. So this frees us from the bondage. When you were a child here, meaning before you were saved, you were in bondage under the elements of the world. You were in bondage to the law. This is why you shouldn't let any man bring you back under tradition or the rules and regulations of the law in order to be saved. And Paul warns about stuff like this in other places. Colossians 2.8, he says, beware. Notice that word, beware. Imagine a big yellow beware sign with exclamation points. He says, beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of men, notice that tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ, if you've been saved by Jesus Christ, then why are you worried about fulfilling the rules and regulations of the law to keep yourself saved? Colossians 2, 20 and 21, Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are ye subject to ordinances, touch not, taste not, handle not, Notice that the law was all about touch not, taste not, handle not, all those do's and don'ts, which all are to perish with the using, after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of will, show of wisdom and will worship and humility and rejecting of the body and, and not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. The law is all about don't do this and don't do that. And if you didn't do all of it that was required, then you were guilty of all of it. In James 2.10, it says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all. 
So it was all about don't do this and don't do that. And maybe you didn't do this or do that. But then if you did one thing, you were guilty of all of it. It was your schoolmaster. You had no power over it. Galatians 4.4, 4, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law. The fullness of the time was when God was ready for the servants to become sons. At this time, Jesus Christ was sent. He had to be made under the law. Jesus was made under the law so that he could take our place under the law and pass every test. And then after, after that, give us salvation freely. You see, the only work that placed part in your salvation wasn't done by you, but it was done by Jesus Christ. He completely con com conquered and completed whatever a man needs to do to be considered righteous. So at salvation, he gives that righteousness to you and takes away your unrighteousness. And the cross pays for it. The wages of sin is death, and Christ died the death of sinners to pay our sin debt. That is the greatest deal you ever saw in your life. That is New Testament salvation, and it has nothing to do with the works on your part before, during, or after salvation. Works aren't even required to prove salvation. In Galatians 4 and verse 4, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law. In this verse, we see the virgin birth. And Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Just by calling him the Son of God, you make him equal with God. But he is born of a virgin. He is made of a woman in the sense that he left heaven and came down in the flesh. And God used a woman, Mary, to bring him in. 1 Timothy 3.16 And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. It says in Philippians 2, 7, but made himself of no reputation, but took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. So he was made under the law. Because verse 5 says, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. So Jesus Christ had to come down under the law to fulfill it and be without sin so that he could redeem us. He had to be sinlessly perfect to be the perfect sacrifice for sins, and he had to take away our sins. All the times we broke the law, and he put it on himself when he died on the cross. At salvation, we were adopted. We became a son of God, and we are still waiting on the adoption to complete, to be complete, when we get our new body. And Romans 8, 23, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. So you were adopted into the family of God when you got born again, and you became an heir. And Galatians 4, 6 says, And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son to your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Abba, Abba is the... Hebrew word for father, you got a new daddy at salvation. My dad didn't spend time with me. He never taught me anything. He died a drunkard. But the heavenly father isn't like that. Here you have Abba. And this is how the Jews would say father. And here you have father. How you would say father. Showing you both Jews and Gentiles reconciled in one body by the cross. Your dad would say he's coming to get you and then he doesn't show up. Even though you waited all afternoon and you were excited about it. Your heavenly father is coming for you and he will show up. Your resurrection is just as sure as the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You're not looking for that blessed hope in vain. But since you're a son, he has his spirit in you. He calls this the earnest of your inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. Basically, what that means is he put the Holy Spirit in you to prove he is serious about coming to pick you up. Before, you had unclean spirits in you. Now, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, according to 1 Corinthians six nineteen and 20. And then in Colossians one twenty seven it says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Ephesians 4.30 says, Ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. That's sealed with the Holy Spirit. 
That is New Testament salvation. This is why you can't lose salvation. I've got Christ in me, the hope of glory. I've got something living in me that keeps everything in the universe from blowing up. I've got something in me that knows every thought. Galatians 4, 7, Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So you're a son. John 1, 12, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Israel was a son corporately as a nation. In Exodus 4.23, God says to Pharaoh, Let my son go, referring to Israel as a whole. They were not sons of God individually back then, like me and you. But now, we can be individual sons of God by believing on him. 1 John 3, 1 and 3, 2. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Before you were a servant in bondage to the law, now as a son you are an heir, and you're free from the law. Now you are a servant of Jesus Christ, a servant to righteousness. Romans six eighteen and 19. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh, for as ye have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity and to in iniquity, even so now yield your members' servants to righteousness and to holiness. You need to be a servant to righteousness. You got a much better paying job since you got saved. It's got a lot better benefits. You have a lot more liberty, a lot better boss. Verse 8, Howbeit then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. Now you need to turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Before you got, you got saved, all your service was to false gods. There was a time when you didn't know God. There was a time when you served a God that didn't even move. It couldn't see, hear, or walk. Verse 9 says, But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? There was a time when God didn't know you in the sense of a son. And that is why Jesus Christ will one day say to people, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. And he'll say, Depart from me, I never knew you. Paul is asking, how can they turn back to the weak and beggarly elements? Meaning, how can they go back to being under the law after they have been freed from the law? Do they desire to be in bondage again? The law leads man to realize he is a sinner because it is a losing battle. But the law can't save you. It keeps you in bondage. And Galatians 4.10 says you observe days and months and times and years. That's what the law was about, observing days and these things. They were in bondage to them. For example, I'm not under the bondage of the Sabbath day, which really is Saturday. The seventh day Adventists got that right. It really is Saturday, but as a born-again Christian, I don't keep the Sabbath. The Sabbath keeps me. Jesus is my Sabbath. I don't have to observe a day. I'm not the nation of Israel under the law. And Romans 14, 5 says, One man esteemeth one day above another. Another man esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. I'm, I'm under no obligation to keep the Sabbath day. I don't have to esteem one day above another. And I'll make the rest of you guys mad now. Sunday is also really just another day. I mean, that's the day we go to church. But it's really just another day. I don't have to exalt that day above another day. If somebody chose to go to church on Saturday, like if a, a group of people chose to do that, that wouldn't be wrong. It's not the day it, that matters. I don't have to do anything special on any given day. I don't have to do anything special on Sunday. Every day is the Lord's day. I don't even like limiting it to that. Because that, whether people know it or not, that puts that in their mind. Well, today is the day I do something for God or I think about God. Deep down they do that. I know that they don't, nobody really, nobody says that really. But deep down they end up doing that. So I really don't set aside a day to do anything different. I mean, I go to church on Sunday. 
but I'm not setting aside a day to do anything different or more for the Lord than I do any other day. I'm trying to do what I can for the Lord every day. And we aren't under any bondage to observe a certain day. I mean, a lot of people will get mad when I say this, but you can mow on Sunday. Really, it's not a sin to mow on Sunday. It really wouldn't be. A lot of people think that you, you have committed the unpardonable sin if you get the mower out on Sunday. And I've I've heard, seen my family say that. But yet they watch TV on Sunday after church. They play games on their phone after church. They would go out to eat after church and everything else under the sun. They say it's a sin to work on Sunday. There are people that believe that is a sin to work on Sunday. Even though it said, One man esteemeth one day above another, and another man esteemeth every day alike, that every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. So they think they say it's a sin to work on Sunday, and they will literally make people feel awful for working on Sunday and put them back under the bondage of observing a day and yet, at the same time, the people putting people down for working on Sunday, they go out to eat on Sunday and support the waitress who's working on Sunday. I mean, if she shouldn't be there, then why should you? I mean, she's got bills just like you got. Thank God you don't have to work on Sunday. You should. We should never try to put people back under observing certain days. And things like that. I mean, I always thought you couldn't mow on Sunday growing up. My papa would never mow on Sunday. But he watched TV. Are you going to get in more trouble on the mower or in your recliner watching Netflix on Sunday? I personally don't mow on Sunday, but it's because I try to get out of mowing as much as possible. Um, your lawn, it just... You got it looking good. Then the next week you go on vacation, you come back, and it just looks like there it, uh, a gorilla could live in there. I mean, it's just very vain. I mean, you spend all this time on it. A few days later, it just looks like trash again. I mean, I've got bigger fish to fry. I keep the yard mowed, but I'm not just going to spend all this time on it. And if you want to, that's fine. I'm not saying that. I don't, even know, I don't even know why I started talking about mowing. But I'm under no obligation to observe a day. It's not even wrong for me to observe a day. Take it that, back that way. You don't want to go too extreme. You don't want to say someone has to observe a day. And it's not wrong for someone to observe, observe a day. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. You got people on both sides complaining about a debt what somebody's doing on a day how about you do what you do on your day let this guy do what he does on his day but i've got christian friends who believe sunday is the lord's day but you did you know that in the bible it never calls sunday the lord's day and if they want to make that the day that they go all out for the lord then more power to them I got friends that don't observe Christmas Day. Oh well, I admire them for it. But if I want to have dinner on Christmas Day and give somebody a gift, then I will. It's not anybody's business what we do on a certain day. It's not wrong. I don't have to observe a day. And I don't have to not observe a day. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. In other words, you should take it easy on things like this because... It puts people back under the bondage of this law where you have to observe days. And Paul says in Colossians 2.16 that no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. So let no man therefore judge you in the respect of an holy day. Don't ju judge me on the Sabbath. Don't judge me on special days. Don't judge me on Mother's Day. If it's a birthday, somebody might make me a cake and I'll eat it. If it's Martin Luther King Day, I don't celebrate him because he denied the virgin birth, but 
I'll take off from work if they call that an off day for him. I ain't gonna lie. Be fully persuaded in your own mind. This is the Bible here. You don't have to observe a certain day. Sunday ain't the Sabbath. Saturday is the Sabbath, but I don't have to keep it. Sunday ain't the Lord's Day. Where in the Bible does it say it's the Lord's Day? We call it that out of tradition. And there ain't nothing wrong with that. But men abstain from mowing on Sunday out of tradition. And that's cool. I admire it if you don't mow on Sunday. But if you're going to be consistent, and if you're going to tell somebody not to mow on Sunday, then you better not do anything else on Sunday either. So it's a sin to get on a mower, but not in your truck, but not in the recliner and watch TV. You know, that's, it always comes out kind of hypocritical for people because they'll, want, they'll not do one thing on a certain day, but then they'll do another. I mean, the... It, if you're calling Sunday the Sabbath, there was a man that got stoned for picking up sticks on the Sabbath. In Galatians 4.11, Paul says, I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. So he's afraid that maybe he's put labor in vain on them because they are trying to go back under the law. Yet deep down he knows it ain't in vain because in another place he said, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. But he's thinking that He's got them saved. They knew salvation by grace through faith. But now they're trying to go back under the law that he saved them from. Galatians 4.12 Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am. For I am as ye are. Ye have not injured me at all. Paul says, be as I am. Paul isn't under the law. He's under liberty now. Before he was zealous in the law. Now he has liberty. But the fact that they were deceived by his works... By the, or by this work's salvation crowd, it didn't injure him at all. He had already been through so much that he was thick-skinned. So then the next verse he says, You know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. He wanted the Galatians to be as he was and put themselves in his shoes. He wanted them to imagine how they would feel if they preached the right gospel to him and then got tricked by a false teacher. Paul didn't get any special attention through his looks. He was a beat-up, frail man. He had infirmity in the flesh. And that light on the Damascus Road messed up his eyesight a little bit. You know the story. And then he got healed right after. But I think right, uh, soon after that, his sign gifts began to wear off, and his eyes must have wore back out as well. And he says in verse 14, In my temptation, which was in my flesh, he despised not nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Paul had something in his flesh that tempted him to do wrong, just like we all do. And even after salvation, your flesh wants to sin. But the Galatians didn't let any of these things keep themselves from receiving Paul. They received him as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. And this verse proves that the angel of the Lord of the Old Testament was Jesus Christ. Galatians 4.15, Where is then the blessedness ye spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. And this verse is what causes many Bible students to believe that Paul had bad eyesight, which really makes sense. And then in Galatians 6.11, it says, uh, Paul says, You see how large of a how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand. You see, most of Paul's epistles are written by someone else as he told them what to write. But the fact that he calls such a short epistle as Galatians a large letter hints that maybe he wrote with big words, words because he couldn't see them so good. Many believe the thorn in the flesh that Paul had was even bad eyesight. In 2 Corinthians 12, 7 and 8, it says, unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations that was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. Joshua twenty three thirteen talks about thorns in your eyes. That could be a hint right there because, you know, they say, they say that his thorn was bad eyesight. I've also heard it 
taught that uh, his thorns were his enemies. That makes sense because it says it's the messenger of Satan. He calls it the messenger of Satan in 2 Corinthians 12, 7. So that would make sense his thorn was people. I've also heard that his thorn was a temptation in his flesh, which would also make sense because of what he's just said to the Galatians. And he says in verse 16, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Many times the person who tells you the truth seems like your enemy in the moment, but they are really your dearest friend. Your parents tell you the truth because they love you. How many times did your parents seem like the enemy? A friend may point you in the right direction and correct you because he cares. A preacher may scream and holler and warn you because he doesn't want to see iniquity be your ruin. In the moment, they may seem like the enemy, but they are just telling you the truth. 1 Corinthians 4.14 I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. A lot of times, it seems like somebody's shaming you or looking down on you but they're warning you. Galatians 4.17, they zealously affect you. Paul's telling the Galatians about these men that's trying to get them back under the law. He says he, they zealously affect you, but not well. Yeah, they would exclude you that you might affect them. The men who were coming in to tell the Galatians that they had to keep the law to stay saved were zealously affecting the Galatians. Many men who teach work salvation are zealous. They knock on more doors. They study much harder than many Christians. They are zealously affected, but not well. This is because you can be zealous in the wrong things. And Paul said they would exclude you that you might affect them. They wanted the, the Galatians to quit preaching grace through faith and rely on the law and circumcision so that they could claim them as a convert for them. And Paul says in verse 18, but it, is a good, but it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing, and not only when I'm present with you. So it's good to be zealous in the right thing. Before Paul was exceeding zealous in the traditions of his fathers, he was exceeding zealous in the law. Now he is zealous in the gospel and the Lord Jesus Christ, not in the works of righteousness that he was doing himself. And Paul wants them to quit being zealous about keeping the law to stay saved, which makes no sense, but be zealous in the true gospel, both when he is there and when he is present with them. That's why he says, and not only when I am present with you. He says, my little children of whom I travail and birth again until Christ be formed in you. Notice he calls them my little children because he is the one who led them to the Lord. The people you win to Christ, according to Paul, are your spiritual children in a sense. He says in 1 Corinthians 4.15, For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. He wants Christ to be formed in them in the sense that they are conforming to Jesus Christ in the word. He doesn't want them conforming to the world, but transforming. In Romans 12.2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Galatians 4.20, I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. So Paul wants there to be, wants to be face to face like he was with Peter when he withstood him to the face and change his voice. He's going to have to rebuke them and get a little tone. He stands in doubt of them. He wonders about them sometimes. Even though we can't see the heart of people, we wonder about them sometimes, their motives, and if, if they are genuine. Paul says in verse 21, Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? So they're desiring to be under the law, and if you offend in one point, you're guilty of all of it. Do they not hear the law? Do they not have enough sense to know what the law is about to realize they can't keep enough of it to keep themselves saved? Now Paul will use an allegory or, or illustration to explain to them the law versus the promise. Abraham and Sarah couldn't have a child. This is the story that you need to know. If you haven't read this story in Genesis, it would be good if you went back and read the story of Abraham and Sarah. 
But the Lord promised to Abraham in Genesis 15 that his seed would be as the stars. He told Abraham to go out and look up one day. He said, look up at the stars. And he said, you, you see those? Can you count all those? And he's like, no, I can't count all those. And so the Lord says, well, that's how many children you're going to have. It's innumerable. And Abraham believed God, and God counted it to him for righteousness, for believing that his seed was going to be as many as the stars. But instead of waiting on the Lord and waiting for his first child, Abraham's wife Sarah gives Abraham her handmaid Hagar so that he can have a baby by her because they don't want to wait. So he, he does have a baby by her. And this child's name would be Ishmael. As time went on, Abraham had the promised child with Sarah named Isaac. And now Ishmael was the child of the bondwoman, which is Hagar. And Isaac is the son of the free woman, which is Sarah. So Isaac, the son of the free woman, Sarah. Ishmael, the son of the bondwoman, Hagar. So Galatians 4.22, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, Ishmael and Isaac, the one by a bondmaid, Hagar, she had Ishmael, the other by a free woman, Sarah, she had Isaac. So the two sons are Ishmael and Isaac. The bondmaid is Hagar, and the free woman is Sarah. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman by promise. So Ishmael was after the flesh, Isaac was by promise. And he who so he who, who was born of the flesh born of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. The bondwoman is a slave. She was in bonds. And this would be referring to Ishmael born to Hagar, the bondwoman. And it and this is going to represent the law because it's the bondwoman. And the law represents bondage. Abraham and Sarah didn't want to wait on the Lord. He got with Hagar had this son of a bondwoman. But Isaac was the promised one. Isaac was of the free woman, which is Sarah. And it was by the promise of God. Now verse 24, which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants. These two boys represent the two covenants. The one from the Mount Sinai, which, which gendereth the bondage, which is Agar. Now Agar... Is, is Hagar. When you take Hagar from Greek to English, it's Agar. When you take it from Hebrew to English, it's Hagar. The Old Testament went from Hebrew to English. The New Testament's Greek to English. And in Greek to English, Hagar is Agar. So Paul is using an allegory. It's a figure or illustration. And he's doing this to show you something about the two covenants. The law is represented by Agar, which is Hagar. And it is about bondage. So she's the bond woman. This represents the law, which is from Mount the Mount Sinai. Because that is where Moses got the law. So that's why it says, The one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth the bondage, which is Agar. See, Moses got the law in Sinai. It puts people in bondage. And here it's represented by Agar. Sarah and Isaac represents the other covenant, the New Testament. Galatians 4.25, For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and entereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. So Agar, representing the law in this allegory, is said to be Mount Sinai in Arabia, because that is where Moses got the law. Then it says in verse 26, But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Now, since the law, the old covenant, is represented by Agar and by Mount Sinai in Arabia, the new one is represented by Jerusalem. And unlike the law, it isn't in bondage. It is free. Verse 27, For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate she hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. Unlike Ishmael, Isaac was of the children of promise. If you're a born-again believer, then you are a child of promise. 
Verse 29, But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. The men going around pushing the law and circumcision for salvation are represented by he that was born after the flesh, which was Ishmael. While the Christians preaching salvation by grace through faith are represented by him that was born after the Spirit, that's Isaac. And just like Ishmael, who was of the flesh, persecuted Isaac, who was of promise, the people who teach the works for salvation today persecute the people who preach by grace through faith. That's why it says the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit. Even so, it is now. Galatians 4.30 Nevertheless, what saith the Scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be made heir with the son of the free woman. The same way they put out Hagar back there in the Old Testament is the same way we need to put that stuff out today, which it's an allegory. So Paul's using it to say you need to push out the law stuff. The any, Push out anything that's saying you're saved by the law. Paul says, nevertheless, what saith the scripture? It isn't what saith the preacher or tradition or the pope or your mother-in-law. Just like Hagar or Agar was cast out, you need to put the works for salvation crowd out. If they never come to a point when they relied on Jesus Christ for salvation instead of their works, then they're not heirs. Galatians 4.31, So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. We are of the free. We aren't in bondage. We have liberty in Christ Jesus. Salvation is through the free gift of God. Here, it's represented by the free woman. It isn't through the law, represented by a slave woman. 